Hey, welcome everyone. Welcome back. Hope you're all having a great Sunday. We've got lots of people in chat. We've got people waiting. Yeah, I know. I said, all right, Cinder Mountain Studio. You know, I said we're live. I meant we're going live in like three minutes. Always giving me grief here. I can't can't catch a break. Can't catch a break. I gotta be, I gotta get you guys in here somehow. And if that means if that means bending things a little bit, you know, I'll make that sacrifice. I'll I'll take your sacrifice. So anyway, we're going to have a great stream today. We're going to talk about, you know, part three of our Origins of Iceland series. Fjolnir's got his full presentation. And it's going to be it's going to be good stuff. So I read through all of Eobriga Saga yesterday in preparation. And, oh, man, the English in Eobriga Saga is so archaic the, the 1880 translation i have it is brutal it made shakespeare look like some modern pop writer that you'd find in a dime store because man that was brutal i'll have to i'll have to read off some quotes for you guys as we go but if you're there you want to say hello to the audience yes good evening uh i think the pagan bros are gonna love this one because we are we get a glimpse of of the old pagan customs of in this stream especially and we're also gonna do a bit of deep dive into archaeology and how pagan rituals might have been you know conducted and evidence that support what it says in the sagas so it's gonna be interesting yeah, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot to cover in this. It's gonna be fun. So yeah, should we just start off as we're going? We don't want to waste you guys' time. You guys have already seen parts one and two. So, and even if you haven't, this will still be fun to get into. So we'll just jump right into it. So tell me, Fjolnir, who is Bjorn Buna? Yes, uh, he was a hersir. We go to the first slide. Okay, he was a hersir from Norway. And, and for those who don't know what a hersir is, um, yeah, so leader of like, what is it, 100 men roughly? No, not, like not, necess not necessarily, because I think his mother or grandmother or something was uh, also called a hersir. So it was more, hmm. more likely uh, like a landowner uh, or a feudal lord or something or just somebody who owned land and with people working on it, you know, something like that. It's like a title. It was not necessarily a warlord. So, but it was the kind of a, almost, I think, a semi-nobility, you know, upper middle class status. And then you had, he was son of a guy called Vedrar Grimur from Sök in Norway, uh, Sogni. I'm not sure quite sure where that is, but it means weather creamer. Uh, and Björn Buna's wife was Vielug, uh, and he had three sons called Trappur, Helgi, and Ketil. And it is said that, you know, every great man is descendant from Björn. And it's interesting because well, the reason why I'm going into Beard's genealogy first is because uh, Thorður colonized Iceland along with, you know, Ketil's offspring. You know, Thorður was Adna Hrappursson. So even though Ketil himself didn't directly colonize Iceland, he died in the Hebrides, a lot of his blood reached these islands, uh, this island. So, and apparently it is said that he colonized Thorður, he colonized with Ingolus approval, which is, which is really interesting because, you know, he didn't just make camp without his, you know, it's kind of a courtesy, you know, implies you know that either Ingolur wanted guys to settle in Iceland or 
or there was this kind of honor culture, you know, you had to ask and you, you couldn't just plant yourself next door, you know, stuff like that. I just, I just really kind of get the insight into, into the mindset. And he lived in a place called Skekkjastaðir, which is, uh, it is close to Reykjavík actually. It is a very beautiful valley with, uh, with like, a, I think there's some geothermal, it, it's near a town called Mosfellsbær. Uh, and I actually, you know, I, I love this place. Um, back in like it's a really really special place there's like a farm there and it is kind of a closed off now and i think you know do, during the old days you know a few a few years ago like me, me and the boys would kind of sneak into that area and do some you know hold like a bonfire and do some, you know, pagan rituals just for the lulls, basically. So, I <laughs> hope I'm not, you know, doing too much to dox myself here, but I think nobody knows about this, but, uh, but it was just, just for the, for the lulls, you know, it's just like, because this valley is kind of huge and there's like almost nobody that lives here, like few farmers. And you can see the picture of it in the next, Next slide. All right, pulling up the next slide. Here we go. Yeah, so, yeah, this is like a valley. And if I were like a millionaire, I would, a billionaire, I would just buy the whole valley and close it off without a question. Um, yeah, and they said that many great men are descendant from Thordur, apparently, so. If you could go to the next slide. So, Ketit Flatnur. Uh, is, you know, his case is very interesting. He is mentioned in, like, many different sagas, like four different sagas. And, you know, I'm going to, this is what's said in, you know, Eirbika saga is, there are like many contradictions between, like a subtle contradiction between what, what is said in the sagas, especially Eirbyggja saga, what's called Eirbyggja saga, like the, and, Lux, and Luxtella saga. Uh, so in, in Eirbyggja, Eirbyggja saga, which means island living, you know, the saga of the island dwellers, uh, the, he is described, you know, something like this, you know, this was during the time that King Harald ruled the Norway, for many wise men fled, you know, and abandoned their lands. Some east of Kjölu, you know, some, apparently some place in Norway, and some west. There were some that stayed the winter in the Hebrides or Orkney and raided Norway during the summer and dealt great damage to Haraldur kingdoms. This is called going Vester Viking or West Viking. Are you familiar with that, that term? Uh, just, just from when I've heard it in in reading the sagas, but I, I'm not familiar with the, the details of it, really. So, that Vester Viking is like, you know, dispossessed or disgruntled Jarls and chiefs from, you know, who were pissed off at Haraldur, going Viking against the Norwegians from Orkney. And, well, like, and that's, we... that's something that's pretty interesting, too, is because... Yeah, yeah. We always think of Vikings as traveling south or traveling west or traveling east. And you think of it as being one way, but there is this very real phenomenon of Vikings who have settled, you know, in, in the Hebrides or Norkney and then traveling back and raiding again. So 
I mean, it's the sort of it's I mean, it wasn't uncommon in this day for there to be sort of Vikings raiding other Vikings. That was fairly normal. And Harold Hardrada had this whole series of I mean, it was somewhat somewhat more organized, but he had these series of Viking raids on Denmark, too. Um, around this same time as well. Yeah, but this is like Norwegians fleeing Norway and raiding Norway again as a retaliation. Yeah. So, uh, and this is like a specific time and a specific place in specific settings. And and yeah, he his wife was Ingveldur, so not Celtic again. His son was Björn Östern, he gets his nickname, it's called Björn the Eastern, and Helgi Bjóla, I'm not sure what Bjóla means, but Bjóla is still a, a last name in Iceland. Uh, and his daughters were Auður hin djúb auða, auðga, which means Auður the deep-minded, which means like she was very intelligent, very sharp. Uh, Thorun Hirna which means Thorin, the horned one. I, I'm not sure what that means. And Jórun Mannvitsbrekka. Now, no, Mannvitsbrekka is a word used today. It means, you know, stupid, an idiot. <laughs> so, so you had like a very intelligent daughter and a very stupid one. So, you know, I'm not sure. And in, in the English <laughs> translations, um, Ketil Flatnafer is referred to as Ketil Flatnose. So Flat, Flatnose, yeah. Uh, Nefur just knows. Nef is knows. Nef okay. is knows. Knows. Oh, okay. It's, it's, a, na, it's a noun. Nefur. Nefur. Ur. Uh, Iceland, is, Iceland is really, really complicated. So uh, it's like an ur. You always add that you are after a noun, you know. So uh, just, just that's like a rule to keep in mind you know <laughs> so, so it turns the the ur turns the naif from a noun to an adjective is that it from nose yes, to nosed Got yes it. yes 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 yeah sorry from a noun to an adjective yeah isn't the nose is a noun nev nosed is an adjective adjective and Again, just kind of to recap a little bit, it's I find it very helpful to have these sorts of presentations which cover and kind of recap the sagas because as you're reading through a lot of these, you have so many characters and oftentimes you have repeating names. So you have multiple Bjorns, you have, um, you have um, multiple, multiple names of, of recurring characters. So... For example, in Eobria saga, you have Snorri the priest, but then later, of course, you have the famous Snorri Sturluson. So, or sorry, the yeah. So it's also yeah, like sure one, one, one of the reasons, you know, one of the reasons why also why we're doing why Iceland, like why why this small island, you know, why not Norway? Why not to a deep dive on the history of Norway? You know, it's not it's not because you know I'm Icelandic stuff like it's because first of all, all of the the bulk of the of the written material, almost all of it is the Icelandic sagas. So everything from this history is the material that we are going to cover, and no. Like there hasn't been a nation in history that has, you know, had so much written about its genesis for such a long time. I can't think of like anything. Like it gives you an insight into how a society is founded, how it's it kind of like a petri dish, you know. It's not just an insight into the old, like into the into the old ways and into the into our history, but it's kind of like a petri dish because there was no outgroup in Iceland. It was just Icelanders and kind of isolated. So we can apply like the Spanglerian model by observing this history, if it's correct or not. You know, 
if there yeah. was like a spring, a golden age, then a decline with, without any other variables, you know. It's like nothing except, you know, there's peop, homogenous people on an island writing everything down. So it's like a really, really good uh, research, you know, ob objective for like a looking at it through a kind of a Spanglerian lens as well, you know. So that's also like also like doing a Bible studies, except you know, soccer studies. We're like dissecting every word, every comparing different contradictions, like thoroughly dissecting this stuff. So which is it has to be done, you know, just also to correct many bullshit, you know, interpretation and circulation that's going going around. So I think that's why this is important. So yeah, if we go to the uh, yeah, yes, and go. and just to keep the the cast of characters because you have you have quite yeah. a few characters to keep track of, and a lot of times, you know, some of these sagas will begin in um, both in in Laxdale saga and in Erbrigga saga. You yeah, have. I you, you have a lot of these, you'll have kind of core characters, but then there are a lot of asides where it kind of goes into these side stories that keep happening. Yeah. I mean, I mean, okay, America has like the Founding Fathers yeah. and a bit, a few more. Uh, Britain has like Cromwell, Henry VIII, and all of the kings. And, you know, a few historical characters, you know, Alfred the Great, you know. We have all of these, like, volumes of guys, you know. <laughs> And their lineage traced. So this is why we need to, you know, keep track of, of them and their their deeds, basically. And the other thing, too, is to keep in mind for, especially for English readers reading these, is that they may be, their names are spelled differently often in the English translations. So... Um, You'll often see different characters. You might see Icelandic characters in the spelling, or you may see, say, with Kettle Flatnose. That might be confusing if someone's like, okay, this is Kettle Flatnose, and someone reads another version that's that refers to him as Kettle Flatnafer. So they but if you but having something like this where you're able to kind of compare and say, no, these are the same character. It's just this is the English spelling, this is the Icelandic. That helps kind of keep it together and organized. But anyway, yeah, let's continue with the uh, Heralders' orders here. Oh no, I think we've have we lost fuel near. Hello, so, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. We... This, this is where we get a lot of contradictions between especially Eirbyggjasaga and Laxdala and Landnamabók. So, you know, uh, yes, Haraldur's enemies, you know, from the Hebrides and Orkney raided Iceland. You know, like I, like I read before, this was during a time that King Harald ruled Norway for many wise men fled under their, their lands some east to the Kjölu, some west. And then, you know, they raided uh, Norway from from the Hebrides and and Orkney, basically, and I think part of Ireland. Uh, and then the landowners pleaded to Haraldur to ask him to relieve them of this abuse. Now, this is in Epikasaga, in Landnamabók. Uh, Haraldur conquered apparently the Hebrides himself, but when he sails west, you know, the Scots and the Irish and other Vikings, like everything goes to hell, basically, all hell breaks loose and he, he loses control of the area. So he sends Ketil to reconquer the Isles. So that is where the story of Ketil begins or how, how he the reason why he sails to the island in 
Lakstaila saga, you know, it is said that in the latter days of Ketil, you know, I rose to power of yeah, when King Harald rose to power, King Harald the Fair here, in such a way that no folkland king or other great men could thrive in a land unless he alone ruled what tithe should be theirs. When Ketil heard that King Harald was minded to put him to the same choice as to other men of might, such as him, namely, not only to put up with his kinsmen being left unatoned, but to be made himself a mere hireling to boot, a mere serf. He calls together a meeting of kinsmen and began his speech in this wise, in this manner. You shall know what dealings there are, there have been between me and King Harald, the which there have, is no need of setting forth, for a greater need besets us, to wit, to take counsel as to the troubles that now are in store for us. I have true news of King Harald's enmity towards us, and to me it seems that the way that we may abide no trust from him in that quarter. So he's basically saying that, you know, Harald is gaining power. He, he is, doesn't have good relations with him and he is probably going to confiscate their lands or kill them. So he has to flee. This is totally different, you know. <laughs> he's he, he's, he's Harald's ally in Erbika Saga, but in Lakstala Sala they are rivals or he's, Get it as a rival, you know, petty king or a, or a rival ch rival chief who is against Haraldur. So, and it says in Lakstala saga, get it flat nose or get it flat never brought his ship to Scotland and was well received by the men there, for he was a renowned man and of high birth. They offered him there such a great station as he would like to take and Ketil and his company of kinsfolk settled down there later of he made peace with a Scot, Scotch and the Irish and got for his own one half of Scotland apparently part of some bargain you know. he had for wife Thuridur he married Thuridur the daughter of Eivindur who was a sister of Helgi Magri or Helgi the Lean. Helgi Magri does not appear in uh, Eirbyggja saga, by the way. The Scots did not keep the peace long, however, and they treacherously murdered him. So, a bit, a bit different here. So this is, you know, this is, this is, you know, where we see also contradiction in, but in Landnamabók, you know, Björn, uh, the reason why Ketil sailed west, because he was sent to reconquer the Hebrides from, from Haraldur after Harald or Harfari had conquered it himself. And then for some reason, Harald didn't want to pay taxes. He just said, you know, fuck your taxes. I didn't want to pay the tithe. He left his son in Norway. And because of that, Harald exiled, you know, both him and his son, he confiscated all of his property in Norway and exiled Björn. So, no, no, that's an Eirbyg, sorry. And, uh, yeah, I think it's both in Landnabók and Eirbyg, sorry. And Helgi Bjóla in Landnabók, if we... In Lakstala saga, Björn sailed straight to Iceland. In Landnabók, Helgi Bjóla also went straight 
went to Iceland from the Herbetes. So he, he touched to the Herbetes first. So if you go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so he apparently conquered the Herbetes. And it says in Eyjabikasa that became chief refuses taxes, you know, according to Landnum book. And he exiled Björn because of, because of this. So, and it is said that in Eyrbyggjasvæga, Björn, you know, he sent two guys, I, I can't remember their names. They're, they're named in, in the, in the sagas. So, he sent two guys to, to come after him. And he held, Haraldur held some, assembled some thing, you know, to discuss this. And he sent these two guys to, to, to kill Björn. And in a big side, it said Björn boarded a skiff or a small boat he owned, taking his household and goods with him. And he sailed south along the coast of Norway. Uh, he sailed until he came upon the island of Moster. If you go to the next slide. Yeah, th this is a this is a historical. This is a historical. Uh, this is a historically I, I, accurate painting. Yeah, this was actually re really found, historical. Yeah, yeah. This was I, I, this was dated to the tenth century. This was found on a on a stone, and the uh, paint they can still find it on there. This is a historical um, a depiction reconstructed from a petroglyph found in the Hebrides of 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 the. Vikings interaction with the Scots. So should I be the should I, here, should I do the Scout voice? Yeah. <laughs> Alright, mate. Quite just a nice looking boat you got there. Hey, maybe me and the lad could help you fix these rudders. You know, we take cash in hand and that need to let the king know about any of this. King's tax and all, none of that round there. Or might you got any axes for sale? Love a good axe. Me dad was killed by an axe once. Anyway, about that boat, you sold it. That is it the fantastic period it was actually voice. Pretty, pretty good. I was, I was. Oh, Norden on says this is a photograph. Actually, you know, I think you might be right. Yeah, this yeah, is the yeah. photograph of the petroglyph. I, 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 I like, I, I like to apologize to Nathan Hood. You know, he, he. I mean, maybe he's not offended, but this is. This is just how it was. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Look, only we only present the raw, unfiltered, yeah, the raw. real, real history here. None yeah, of this. Yeah. None of this uh, covered over, uh, fluffified stuff. <laughs> okay. If you go to the. <laughs> all, right, all right. We'll keep going. Okay. So. Yes, uh, he sailed until he came to the island of Mostar, which is, I think it's called Mosteroi in today. I was, I was like trying to find this, it took me a while to locate this island. It's, uh, which lies off southern of her Hörland. That is mentioned in the sagas, it's south of Hörland. Uh, there he was received by a man named Hrólfur. And he is uh, one of the main characters and a very interesting character. So, Hrólfur was a prominent chieftain, a man of great largesse. He maintained a temple to Thor on the island and was a great friend of Thor's and he was a devout follower of Thor. It was because of this that he was known as Thor Olver, was his nickname. He was a big man, bulky, handsome and strong, and he sported a huge beard, which led him being nicknamed Most Mostraskek. Now, 
skegg, you know, means beard. Moisture in is, is the island. But uh, when somebody in Iceland, when somebody lives on an island, he's called Eya Skeggi, like a native islander. Skeggi, you know, is, is, is an Iceland word for islander. So I'm, I'm thinking, is it dire derived from this character, Thorolur? So henceforth, like all islanders are called Eya Skeggi after Thorolur Mostarskegg, or was, was before him. I, I wonder that, you know. So that's that's kind of interesting. Yeah, and uh, he's he's mentioned. Um, isn't he mentioned in Abria Saga as well? This is only he only mentioned Abria Saga. Yeah, yeah. This is they have, the whole, they have the whole section about. Yeah, he's not mentioned in the Laxdala Saga or London book. I think I think he's only mentioned Abria Saga. And my, I'll I'll have to okay. So I have to show you guys this because when I went through. The entirety of Eobrea Saga yesterday. Um, all you just have to read some of this language from this translation. So that same autumn, folk held a thronged sheepfolding at Tongue up from Holyfell, betwixt it and Lax River. Thither went to the folding of the home men of Story the priest, and Mar Halwoodson, the father's brother of Story, was at the head of them. So, I mean, it's like a hundred pages of this this sort of language. So, it took me quite literally the whole day. To yeah, I, I, I think, all I, of it. I think uh, you always seem to be really good at getting like really bad translations. <laughs> I know, uh, it's incredible. It's incredible. <laughs> My translation of Lax Dallas Saga is much more readable. Um, it, this one, I believe, was fairly accurate, but it is somehow the oldest english i've ever read i'm just gonna read you know you know i i translated a great deal myself so i'm just gonna read that <laughs> you know and basically so i'll just you know mentioned mention you know what what it says so Yes, I said he was a prominent man of large chess. This is how he's described. He was nicknamed Thorul Moster Mostraskek. Uh, Thorulver Mostraskek held a great bloat. So I think. And what? You, and do you want to yeah. do you want to explain what a bloat is? So. Bloat is a, you know, is a pagan ritual. We're not sure what it is, but it said that he held a great sacrificial feast during, you know, so it's a, both a sacrifice and a feast and blood is involved. And we're going to go uh, more into it later, but he just held, you know, when, when Björn arrived, he held a great bloat which he considered his dear friend, you know, consulted his dear friend Thor about whether he should reconcile himself with the king. You know, he should basically hand over Björn to Haraldur or... No, sorry, sorry. After Haraldur arrived, sorry, Haraldur arrived to claim like to ask, he tracked down Björn, and I think Haraldur was on the island. He, he, he confronted Thorulur. And when he confronted Thorulur, I think, I don't, can't remember if the Björn was on the island or whether he'd left. He, Thorul basically told him to fuck off. You know, he's like, this is my island. Uh, and if, you know, you exiled this man, thus I will exile you from, you know, my island, uh, you know, treat you as you have treated, you know, this man of noble birth. It's like a, it's like a complete, just told the feds to fuck off, basically. So, <laughs> so, so he, he had to consult the oracles whether to recompense the king 
or seek another fate because this apparently pissed Haraldur off quite a bit. So uh, the Oracle directed and yeah, he Björn sailed to west and he gave him his son. Uh, I think his name Hallstead. His son he, he, he gave him a ship and his son with the ship. So it's like really strong, you know, honor culture there, you know. So his son wanted to go to Iceland as well. And and the fate, you know, an oracle directed Thorul to Iceland. So you have another reference of he held this bloat after he told Haraldur to fuck off and after he, I think he had given him he, Björn his longboat and his son when he sailed away, I, I think so. So, uh, so an oracle directed Thorul to Iceland, just like Ingolf saga. So we know like pagan rituals included oracles probably female oracles. The F the they're called the F in, in Icelandic, uh in Old Norse. Uh, he got himself an ocean going ship and prepared for a journey to Iceland, taking with him his household. He dismantled the temple to Thor, which is really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I found that part kind of surprising. Yeah, yeah. He dismantled the temple. Loads you know, it all I, up on his ship. Yeah, and all his, and he like buries and he takes up dirt, you know, from the soil of the temple with yeah. him. And I want, do you have any idea how big this temple would have been? Because it doesn't, probably, it doesn't probably say. really small, probably really small, because yeah. we, we're going to like archaeology, archaeological found nearby of a, of a similar temple. It was not big, but, uh, and I explain a bit, you know, the con construction possible. Yes, he took with him all his household. He took with him the te dismantled temple uh, and his, you know, and his goods. And many of his, you know, friends, you know, decided to go on to the journey with him. But basically, all of his crew. I think most of, you know, the inhabitants of Mosteroy wanted to went with him. His son was already heading to Iceland or in Iceland. Uh, he dismantled the temple and transported the mo most of his timbers, you know, it's made like of a timber posts. Yeah, together with the earth underneath the pedestal, which Thor had been placed, probably the totems of Thor. So they were like these totems inside the temple, probably the same ones which he used to toss overboard. They were inside the temple, these, these totems, you know, carved out with the face of Thor. And there were always, I think, two of them. Then Thorul sailed out to the sea with a fair wind and came with a sight of land sailing then west along the southern coast around the Reykjavnes Peninsula. So they always land, I think, southeast all the time. And then they sail along the coast and they all to Reykjavnes like a really common route yeah and you see the same practice of having these totems and throwing it overboard and finding oh where where we'll land and we'll follow that you see the i mean you see that earlier in law number book as we covered um in previous weeks yeah they always say so you start to get kind of this pattern yeah it's like an established route now landing southeast sailing west or, or more or just directly south sailing west to the Reykjanes Peninsula. Uh, and then the, the wind dropped, it is described, and they could see on the on the shore with a broad fjord cut into the land. Now he sailed all the way up. If you can if you can here we go. Yeah, this is Mo Mosteroy, Most Moster Moster Island. Uh, can you can you? 
Yeah, I, I think there's a there's a yeah we, uh, there's a map in in late, later. Uh, this is this is mostly if we go to the next slide. All right, let's see here. There we go. Yeah, th this is Moster. I I know nothing about this. You know, maybe if Wallace was here, he could. Like, is, if this is some resort for boomers or something. So or, this is in Norway then now. Yeah, this is. I think probably wealthy people live there with like boats and stuff. <laughs> and uh, but they have they have found like a. I think there was like a medieval monastery there or something. Uh, I'm not sure if they found the remains of a temple there, but but I, I suspect, you know, it described, you know, he took it with them and uh, pop, nothing was left. Obviously, these temples were small, didn't leave much of a trace. So really hard to to locate them. Yeah, so it's just just sort of like a suburb of Stavanger. Yes, can you go to yeah, Iceland, can, yeah, an Icelandic yeah. map? We can get a... Yeah, so you see, zoom, zoom out. Zoom, zoom in, zoom in, sorry, zoom in. In, in, in. Okay, so... So you see these two peninsulas. The, the one that looks like a boot. That's called Reykjanes. And then there's Faxaflói, you know. And the, this other peninsula is called Snæfellsnes. And the fjord above that is called Breiðafjörður, Broadfjord. This is where Thorul settled and landed. Remember in Flóki, the Flóki stream, he settled in Breiðafjörður and landed in Reykjanes when he was returning. Uh, Reykjanes and Snæfersnes, they are like really in, like kind of a two contradictory locations, you know. Reykjanes is kind of this gloomy, dark, you know, peninsula is like a lot of volcanic activity, uh, lot of, you know, it's like you know, it's like a, like a kind of a dark aura to it, you know, it's like, I don't like that place, but Snæfellsnes, it's like, it's like it has its reach into like another dimension, it, it is otherworldly, it, it looks like a Van Gogh painting, you know, <laughs> the, the, all of the landscape, it's like, it, it looks like a, the realm of Siagorath or something, in, <laughs> it's just like two completely different, you know, areas uh, and like a lot of historical landmarks in, in Snæfellsnes. It's, you can see, we can see pictures of it in later slides. So, uh, yeah, just, yeah, so, yeah, this is the, this is the, so, you set, he sailed out to sea with a fair wind landed side sailing west along the southern coast along the Cape Reykjanes. Uh, when the wind dropped and they could see the shore, when the broad fjords, Breiðafjörður, which is where I pointed out, uh, where Breiðafjörður cut into the land, Thorul cast over, it was all the way to Breiðafjörður then, yeah. Thorul cast aboard, you know, the totems. Again, the same thing as Ingolur, which had been in his temple. This is directly mentioned in the sarcas. The totems were inside the temple, one of which had the Thor's face face carved on it. Only one of which, you know, who was carved on the other. So that's that's a that's that's, that's a, a good question. In, yeah, it's a good question, you know. And whose face was carved on Ingolus totem? Uh, I think, you know, Thor is, seems to be associated with sea travel in a lot, in a lot of the circus. Every, you always seem to have, like hold the bloat to Thor before embarking on a sea journey. He seems to be like in control of the seas, apparently. I, I think so. 
so which is which is quite interesting and then Thoral declared that he would settle in Iceland wherever the Thors Thor directed the pillar on, onto the land which was somewhere inside the fjord as soon as the pillars were thrown overboard they were swept towards the more westernly parts of the fjord of the fjorders and seemed to travel faster than he expected and as that he he put it into halfway along the southern shore of the fjord fjorder, Breiðafjörður, and anchored its ship to cove there which has been named Hofsvogur, which means temple. Vogur is like a, a it's, it's kind of like a miniature, I think, fjord also. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a kind of like a week. It's an Icelandic word. You have like many, it's like the Eskimos have like 10 words for snow. We have like, you know, 10 words for further, you know, <laughs> or, or like three. It's like Vogur Vík, you know, fjord, Fjörðurs and Peninsula. So after that, they explored the area and found that th th the pillar of Thor were already ashore and on a tip of the headland it's like on, on the on the also a miniature peninsula i will show you a map of it later uh, north of the cove of, of the of the walk walkers like water is like a cove or something the headland or the peninsula was nes it's called nes sorry it's like a peninsula is like a huge area a nes is like a smaller one and the airy is like a tiny tiny one similar to you know further it's like a really really large and a week is like a really small smaller one so and the headland was seen the 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 ness was seen, since called thor's ness obviously so <laughs> And there he built a, uh, he settled near Hof's Vogur. And there he built a great temple. So if we go to the next slide. Yeah, he, here we go. This, Thor's this is nice. like, yeah, this is like miniature jutting out of the peninsula. This is a Ness. So you can see right here from the satellite view. Yes, this is Thorsnes. There you go. Yes. And so are there any remnants of this temple then, or do we know exactly where it was marked? I'll get to that later. Uh, All right. Where, where, where you know, get to that later, but there is a church there now, and there was a, there was a thing established there, but yeah, like I said, I'll, I'll get to that later. So, uh, if you go to the next slide, this is Snifelsness. This is like, this is how everything looks there, like this. Yeah, incredible. Wow. This is like a like I mean, a Van Gogh painting, you know. Yeah, I mean, particularly rugged. It doesn't look like uh, you're gonna. I mean, can you even have cattle here? I don't think you could grow much. Yes, you can. You could, yeah, a lot, yeah. lot of farmland there, but it's like there are these areas where like a lot of lava and mountains and stuff, but they're like you know farmlands. So, like for the train we're looking at here, is this largely sort of rocky ground then? Yes, um, this is like a lava field. Yeah. Okay, yeah, but that's but you would say that's only only part of it is like a lava field. Yes, but you know a lot of it looks like it's like a 
pretty yeah. magical magical place you know it's like that's cool so if you go to like there, there's like a rumors also like snifels jökull it's like a lot of paranormal shit are supposed to happen there you know in in was it uh journey to the center of the earth they are supposed to enter through snifels jökull mm. oh interesting yeah I you know, so, it. so it's like and apparently people see a lot of ufos there and stuff like that and and it'll for, folklore yeah. like a lot of elves you know site you know <laughs> encounters <laughs> this is like a place where where you know where the world is thin you know portal to to another another dimension or something but, yeah and there's yeah. no shortage of of sort of hauntings or other strange events um, this is where the immaterium spi the spills yeah. out into the to the real world so this is thorstness uh these is the, it's what you would call the the chaos wastes <laughs> okay no i would actually say i would actually say the uh the um uh, the other peninsula is a uh, is a uh, it's the chaos waste oh wait would you say um would you say the peninsula to the north no to the Not south to the south okay Reykjanes. Reykjanes. Reykjanes, Reykjanes is more like because that it's like a that's like a realm of corn thorstness is like nema um uh, snifersness is more like the realm of sinch you know oh okay so here so, so Re Reykjanes corn, is like really man. barren and you know blasted wastes and volcanoes uh a lot of you know there's an eruption ongoing there right now but snifersness is like everything is like colorful weird magical so yeah, it's it's corn, corn and unseens basically. So <laughs> okay, so anyway, yeah, yeah. So uh, th thorsness. Yes, uh, th thorsness. Uh, yeah, go to the next slide. Alrighty. So. uh now now the temple, temple yeah this is this is a really interesting you know facet in the sarcas this is where we get the most i think the most accurate description of a temple in the sort like ever you know but how the temple was built the ritual the you know the assembly you know the, the pre-christian customs I can't think of this is like the most like they always reference this part yeah so so the temple is described as you know with doors on each side like he set up the same temple again in Hofsvogur Thorsnes uh, one side yeah closer to one end the totems were placed inside the temple you have your totems in the center Yes, in, in, in some sort of, you know, special room or something and or in the center of the temple. In the totems were apparently some nails, special nails called Reyin Naklar. You know, its meaning is unclear, but it's, you know, it's a compound of the word Reyin, which means powers, rulers, God, sacred, and knuckles, which means nails. So it, it could have been, so it could have been like some special items nailed into the totems. Uh, and the nails are mentioned also in uh, Gailongskvida, uh, which is a medieval poems by Olavur Loftunga from around 1030. And in it, Thorin is advising King, you know, Svet Knutsson of Norway. This is like long after, this is around 1030, like encouraging him to pray to his predecessor, Olaf the Second, Olaf the Second of Norway. You know, the poem is about our earliest evidence for, you know, yeah, so 
it says you know þú þá þú rekur fyrir eigin nagla bókamál spænir þínar so it's basically the poem is about our you know it's the earliest evidence for all of status as a saint in Norway it's it's like and it associates the, the nails to some books or some book covering or something it's a really weird reference so we, we don't have no idea what this is but it might have been you know like also might have been some sort of ideological term I mean, who knows? But I think they were like physical objects. They are described yeah. as such. But we haven't found Which one is, yet. I mean, it is interesting too because you do have this. I I have heard the claim made from some sort of neo pagans that, um, like worshiping God or worshiping the divine in in a building or in a church in a temple like that that's weird and that. Paganism used to all be about nature and sort of worshiping the gods and experiencing that all outdoors. But you do have this actual practice, which is worship within a temple. Well, well so you have the concept of the temple isn't. I mean, well, it's, it's not something that's foreign or alien. Will you will you have a literal description of a pagan temple? Yeah, which were later converted to churches. And the only thing they did is that they added like a extra entrance, like a like a they just added, they just elongated the building. The center was exactly the same, and they even used the same altar. So it's like that, there's like archaeological evidence for for that. So yeah. what the fuck are they talking about? <laughs> Everybody worshipped in temples. Like, uh, I think the only, like, Stone Age animism, perhaps, you know, would be in some oh, nature. True. <laughs> I don't yeah. know, I don't know. Yeah, you have your, uh, you have your, um, yeah, you have your great, um, oh, shoot, why am, why am I blanking on the name of it? The Stonehenge, Stonehenge, yeah. I mean, that could maybe be outdoors, although, do you think Stonehenge, now this is going on a tangent, do you think Stonehenge may have, had more to its structure and that all that's left is the stones. Okay, Stonehenge is also there? a temple. And it is like, isn't it like, you know, pre-bronze? It is like oh, thousands, yeah. thousands of years. It's not Indo-European as well. It's like, yeah. it's this is a Germanic Indo-European tradition that we are describing here. And they use temples. So being hippie nature worshippers and saying that is true tradition, you know, uh, no, no fucking way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Teutonic <laughs> Warrior raises an interesting point. Yeah, I mean, temples do yeah. pretty much every, well, I suppose not every civilization, but but certainly most and yeah i mean there is still this nature component um that is especially strong uh, but the, but the, but the shinto temple also but shinto also use temples it is a, like a yeah. human universal mm. like i think i can't think of any iron post iron age or iron age civilization that or even bronze age like they didn't use some form of temples. You know? I suppose even the yeah, even, even the Mayans and the Aztecs had temples. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if I come to t continue with a with a description of the temple. Uh, so if you if you are a neo pagan, you should listen to this and adjust your rituals accordingly and stop being a hippie and smoking mushrooms. <laughs> this is how you should worship. Uh, so in epic saga, the inside of a temple, you know, is compared to like a songhouse of a church, because you know they were Christian, they were just making a reference, you know, the Senkus. Uh, and in the middle of the floor, there was a stall that seemed to function as an altar. 
you know, the stall was probably a rock of some sort. On the stall was a ring that men swore oaths to. The ring was kept by the Hof Godi, which was means temple Godi, which was a special title, a special type of Godi that just managed the temple and managed the ritual. Uh, during rituals and yeah, meetings rituals. On the stall was also uh, like a stone cup, like a crude cup carved from stone. It's called Kleit Botli, which was a, it was like a bowl or a cup carved from stone. I th I'm not sure if there's a picture of it, but they, they found one recently, actually. And wow, it contained Rosa. with, with, they found with blood? one. Yes, with like remnants of wow. Yeah, remnants That's of blood. Incredible. Yeah, so uh, and contained blood from animal sacrifices, and there was like a special twig inside called hlutstig, and they used it to sprinkle the blood during rituals. Like I'm not sure, like maybe onto the guys or onto the altar or something. So get like a insight into. So, and the sprinkled blood itself was called hlöyt. So it's hlöyt. like hlöyt. It's kind of like a sacred sprinkled blood by the Hofgoði from sacrificed animals. And all of the other Godi, they circled around the stall during meetings and rituals. And all of the thinkmen which was men who were a part of the of the thing, local thing, which I think they weren't necessarily godi. They were just there was a godi for each thing, I think, and then it was think men, probably some sort of hersir or something, that took part in the thing. I'm not so sure, but they had to pay a tithe to the temple and were bound to escort, you know, the, the Hofgoði on travels, probably to Althingi, which was the all thing, which all, which is where all of the Godis met in Thingvellir. Nordenon brings up an interesting Joseph de Maestra quote, which is, wherever an altar is found, their civilization exists. Yeah, that's an interesting it's an interesting quote because I think it indicates that when what having a, a sort of formalized sacrifice ritual indicates having an altar because the altar is the place where you um, well sometimes where you sacrifice sometimes where you just honor yeah so gods, if you, if but, also, also Teutonic warrior said you know this quote alone speaks for everyone here against new pagan like. I don't have anything against the new pagans. Like they can, you know, be worshipped old gods, but at least do it right, you know. And I'm like teaching you how with this <laughs> by going to the sakas. So Yeah, and well what well, the the importance of having a place to sacrifice and having that be a formalized ritual is that it is in a sense, and this is sort of borrowing a little bit from Jordan Peterson, but it's this idea of sacrificing to the future, or you're you're laying aside your your concerns of the moment and your limited resources of the moment, and you're giving up that freely so that you can have something greater in the end. And it's doing this consciously, you know, yes, I mean, in a I, ritualized form. But, but you I need think that for civilization because you need it, to be it, able to have groups of people willingly giving up that which they own in their time and their resources and their energy. Yeah, I think I, I, I think them. I think, you know, you know, their mindset or their they didn't their metaphysics wasn't ne nearly as deep as that, you know. Yeah, it was probably like, well, I I better sacrifice so that, you know, we have a good harvest or so that I don't drown in the sea when I travel. If I if I literally don't sacrifice in the temple, I will like die and be cursed by Thor. Yeah. Uh, I will drown in the sea or my children will die. That's literally the mindset probably. 
Oh, there's probably, a, yeah. There's also but... a mindset in Rome. Like, in the Roman, yeah. worshipping the, the pagan gods of Rome was like a national security issue. If you don't do a specific ritual during a specific time, you would lose the battle. So they had to, like, wait, hold their armies during a full moon to make conduct the ritual correctly like really superstitious stuff you know so yeah but <laughs> but it still has the same i think it still has the same net effect on civilization is that it is yeah. this kind of development um that is necessary or this ability but yeah there yeah. is i mean it is much more literal and real for them it's not as abstracted yeah it's an abstraction came like it's post enlightenment cope basically of of these of his stuff but they 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 literally you know like if you are a company pagan you have to have the post the pre-enlightenment mindset mm, like yeah. literally, that is the danger it is very easy to oppose the post enlightenment idea of you know pulling everything out to uh to an evolutionary perspective or to a sort of rationalist um highly abstracted perspective where everything is you, you have to say, through this psychological lens yeah. but that's not how they would have more than likely thought about it you have to have their mindset you have to say the gods literally exist and they will smite me down if i don't sacrifice or curse me that's that's how you that's the real that's like the chat version of it you know and there is there is <laughs> a little bit of that too. there is some of that i mean or even a strong element of that too in Christian belief too, because, and again, you have like the case of the, the couple who lies about their tithe. Um, they lie about what they tithe. Then God just immediately strikes them down and they drag their bodies out because, you know, they lied to, they lied to God. Yeah. They lied to the church. Isn't that more like old Testament? Though? That was in, that was in the new Testament though, which no, is what is, which is what is interesting too, is you still have this element very strongly in the New Testament. Yeah, but it was probably also influenced by Roman, the Roman mindset of worship, like heavily. So, I, I think you know. Could could be, um, but certainly it's. I mean, in the Christian perspective too, is, I mean, you sort of get certain modern Christians who kind of have this idea of God as this abstracted. You know, God is the what you sacrifice to in the future that helps you out later. But that's not really like official Christian doctrine. That's sort of a, a hyper rationalist idea of Christianity. Whereas like for 90 percent of, you know, Orthodox believing, not Eastern Orthodox, but just like believing in traditional Christianity, it is believing in the very real, very direct, literal existence and presence and capability and power of God. Well, the two competing uh, theories, like if you look at the, um, during the times of St. Augustine and, and then later the times of Ju in the Julian Apostles, you can read their works, how they describe God, like the early Christians, or maybe like 300 years later, like it's not that long, but the true Christian doctrine is God is an abstract, he's, but he's a person. But here's this, like, you know, Platonism and Christianity, they sort of agree on the metaphysic, but they disagree on the nature of God. You know, God is, in, Pla in the Platonist mindset, the God is, the God, God is like some sort of in, uh, impersonal force that manifests through other, like, through higher beings and then through humans and we must perfect ourselves through knowledge to uh, perfect the creation of god well in christianity god is a person he's completely sovereign and there's nothing we can do to do anything you know to to perfect his creation like he all, all powers with him so that's like a metaphysics they agreed on the basics of the metaphysics but the concept of God and sin also like the Platonists believe that sin was from ignorance but the Neoplatonists especially the Plotinus and and, and the, his crew but St. Augustine came up with like sin is 
not from ignorance like people can willfully sin even with the knowing they were single they're sinning this was the main debate in rome like yeah. people i don't think people during that time actually really believed in the old gods the same way they did during the bronze age you know during the like the mm. founding mm -hmm. like during the earlier times like they, they were like this was the new trend this was like a new thing that was going on and then, like christians apparently won the debate you know and yeah, yeah well, so, and once you get to say saint aquinas you have i mean god is described almost in these purely ontological terms and yeah. it's a bit it, it still is i mean but even to say aquinas who has this very kind of abstracted view it's nonetheless still 100 percent real in his view that you know god can tangibly impact the world and has agency and isn't this this higher concept but is actually a real a real uh being well who is the origin and and creator of everything and can tangibly affect reality on the ground and very well could just smite someone should, well the should he should he believe so well the well the you know the core of christianity is like god is personal and he can manifest that's that's the core basically and he did so so i would like view christianity as like a it's not it's kind of like a expansion to the older pagan as c.s lewis described christianity is like a fulfillment of of true pagan ideas the, the, the good mm. ones you know disregarded yeah. the the superstitious you know temple prostitutes and the, and the crap the sacrifice so it's like you know why play starcraft when you can play brute wars you know brute wars has everything that starcraft has plus more basically that's that's uh, at least how saint augustine put it you know c.s lewis also so. yeah yeah i did appreciate when saint augustine specifically <laughs> mentioned he's like yeah starcraft 2 especially just really sucked and was not an improvement yeah so 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 paganism like <laughs> anyway, no, 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 anyway. most paganism is like starcraft 1. <laughs> right right yeah. yeah yeah so it's like really really primal and really really you know but like i said we, we, we need to know about this stuff and it's in, in, important to understand this and how our ancestors and our heritage obviously so if we uh if we, if we continue to describe the yes i i was described uh, now i'm going to reference a another temple that was discovered the, compared to an archaeological finding uh this is Hofst this is not the same hofstadir that was found it is not on the on the peninsula that th on the post you know uh, thought Thor lived in uh, Th Thor lived in uh, this is further north but this is one of the most more remarkable archaeological findings in Iceland uh, this is uh this is also called Hofstadir. Hofstadir just means temple place direct translation and this is a name of the viking era settlement located in upper laxo valley in northeastern iceland it was in use between uh, 940 to 1070 AD. So, and the Viking Age, the, yeah, like late Viking Age to the early Middle Ages. So, and and the Viking Viking Age site consisted of a of a large hall-like building, you know, several adjacent pit houses. To go to the next slide. So, use uh, a nice top-down cutaway. Yeah. yeah long it's like a long hall like building and these pit houses this is like also a typical like a like like the the scowly the early settlement they started out as these small you know 
central, only the center, but smaller, but then they added, you know, these later, these long, these, these, these adjacent houses. This was like a later addition, I think, you know, especially if the farmer was wealthy. So it's called pit houses, uh, pit house dwellings, you know, where they kept, you know, cattle and other storages and, and, and they were connected to the main hall, you know, to reserve heat. So you have one who stored cattle and the heat from the cattle would transfer into the main longhouse. It was to, it was basically a, a thermal storage system, you know, the whole of it. Hmm. Yeah, very, very, very had, efficient. Yeah. And would you have had animal pens then connected to transfer heat as well? Yes, one of those adjacent houses would have been an animal pen. So perhaps fourteen or or, uh, or yeah, maybe near another, eight. Yeah, yeah, and another I think might have been an outhouse or uh, something like that. You know, so uh, there's actually are several reconstructions of these in Iceland, but. Yes, and a boundary wall enclosed a 4.5 acre field where hay was grown and dairy cattle were kept during the winter. So from from its ex first excavation, the you know the monumental size of its central hall and its place were, were seemed to indicate that the the settlement was you know a heathen cult site. Was and would these like a, temples have also been covered in turf as well? The, the thing is, this was, uh, yes, yes, like, like the, obviously, but th this is not the same as the temple. <laughs> no, no, it was, uh, if you rotate it to the side, the outline yeah. looks like a... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, but there's a difference between a longhouse, like a long, turf longhouse, and the temple like the, one of the smaller temple that, that Thorolu probably used. That was like probably made of only of wood, you know, not mm, exactly yeah, the, yeah. yeah, but- Cause that it, wasn't built originally. I mean, that's just sort of wood planks or boards that were likely taken apart. Cause it, I mean, cause it wasn't originally from Iceland, so. So it wouldn't have been built with turf initially, I wouldn't imagine. I don't know, but this could have been like there's there evidence that you know suggests that these longhouses were also temples. You know, they had a temple inside them. Hmm. So there was like two kinds. There was a temple that served only as a temple, it was really small. And then there was a longhouse. This is like a really rich, this is a huge, really rich guy on this like a really wealthy dude and he had probably maybe had a temple inside in the center so which was also evidence from from norway and so you have you see like a two different modes of temple building you know temple culture so this monumental size and like and the central hall was like placed differently than because other longhouses like this have been have been located, have been excavated, and and the, and the central hall of this was like really weird. It was different, so which is why it indicates a, a heathen temple inside the hall. So from mid twentieth century, uh, you know, this interpretation was kind of challenge, you know, because. The site, you know, it was, although it was large, you know, pretty much like any other farmstead, you know, it could have been just a different architectural, you know, layout instead of a temple. Yeah. But but recent archaeological excavation suggests that Hofstad was primarily like a chief settlement with a great hall used for ritual feasting and events. So during the Viking Age. So sort of like a, a, a mead hall of sorts. 
Yes, a meat hall. And there's like a theory, like I said, a temple could have been in the meat hall. Mm. This is like an Icelandic meat like hall. Like you slide so, the chair, you slide the benches and the tables off to the side. And all right, now we're having our temple. Yeah, yeah. So, so du- during the Viking Age, you know, fairly robust population, you know, occupied the site. This was like a hub. This was like a center. Yeah. Like a, like a social. This was only like a, rich guys for this was like a like a community center basically as well so occupied the site and during the spring and summer especially but fewer people in the winter apparently I, they might have moved south or or south or, or just moved maybe to the Hebrides during the winter who knows during the settlement period so but the site's largest, you know, building is a hall. It's typical of Viking sites, except, you know, that it's twice as long as an average Viking hall, at least in Iceland. So at, you know, 38 meters, uh, the hall is the largest long, Norse longhouse yet excavated in Iceland. Uh, a separate room from the north end has been interpreted as a shrine or an inner sanctuary. So, like I said, it could have been a rich guy and just a temple, small sanctuary placed inside of the longhouse, of the meat hall. Uh, you know, where the wooden stake with carved faces representing Nordic, Nordic gods may have been housed. That's like a strong possibility. So, where it says location and number of skulls, do you know, is this referring to human skulls? Yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, <laughs> Yeah, plot, plot for the plot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah so, the corn, the corn. Ah, ah yeah, yeah. Okay, go to that later. Okay, based on, you know, warrior scenes, the whole may originally been, you know, planned as a shorter building and only been extended to fit its full length as a result of substantial enlargement near the end of the 10th century. So it may be stuffed, it started probably out smaller, but was enlarged later. You see, that's very, that was very common during the era. So, and they found bone fragments, you know, in the, near the, the supposedly sanctuary, you know, you know, and the majority of the bone fragments, you know, they represent, you know, normal refuge of the Viking settlement, you know, like a slaughtered cattle and stuff like that. Uh, ram- you know, waste basically. But however, however, a group of cattle skulls with an abnormal butchering marks found in in and around the Great Hall display signs of ritual slaughter. Mm. So, so they were killed in an unusual manner. Which is, which is, you know, quite weird. They were like, I think, struck like, uh, struck in a particular manner that would made them bleed out while they were standing. They, oh, they, okay, yeah. So this like cutting is cutting an ev- artery or something. This is evidence of ritual slaughter. Interesting. So well, I guess it would have had to have left a mark on the bone too. Yeah, they they skull. saw they they compared it to ordinary butchered cattle, and there was like they, either this guy was like really bad at butchering, or he was uh, <laughs> just kept like missing. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you go to the next slide, so this this is the uh, the temple at Ranheim in in Trondheim. Yeah. So yeah. this is I was totally... picturing something like that initially when he was talking about um, yes. his temple that he was deconstructing, something sort of like the size of a of a I don't know, like a small shed. This or a is large most li- shed. yeah, this is most likely the temple that Thoral was, was built and used. And this is like made of mostly of wood and you know it could disassemble it. And not until later that like you either had these small temples 
or you had like a temple inside the longhouse. Like two different versions. So the pre-Christian cult sites in Scandinavia, they often consist often consisting of settlements with a large central hall and a smaller, you know, attached building have been discovered in eastern Denmark and, uh, and you know, southern Sweden, in, in Skåne and in Norway. However, the Hof, you know, may have been, this Hof, however, may have been built so, sometime around 480. This is really fucking old. And this is like a standalone Hof. This is not attached to a, a longhouse or a meat hall. And it may have been in use for like hundreds of years. And the site was intentionally disassembled and buried under a thick layer of peat mm. moss. Oh, interesting. To keep so, it preserved. Yes. This is, you're not talking about the site in Denmark, you're talking about the site in Iceland. No, this is in Trondheim. Oh, you're talking about the Trondheim one, okay. Yeah. No, the, the one, the Iceland one was not disassembled. Oh, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. So, this, this is, I'm talking about the one in Trondheim. It was, it was disassembled and buried under a thick layer of intentionally. So, the, the Runheim, you know, Hof consisted of a altar, you know, traces of a pole and traces of a pole building. Which probably housed idols in from the poles with with the carved faces of the gods, at least Thor, you know, and and the procession belt. The youngest dating of the site is from eight hundred uh, from the years eight hundred ninety five to nine hundred and ninety in Trondheim. So the building was not used as a dwelling, obviously. Among other things, it had no fireplace. Inside the house, you know, traces of four po posts may have been evidence of like a high seat. So you could like maybe Hofko, it was in like a throne or something, or on a stall, which is, which is really interesting. And, and, and among the bones, found in that temple a human skull and several human teeth were identified. Mm. So now blood the for, thickens. Blood for the blood god. Skull yeah. for the skull for... So, real, the real thing I'm wondering about is if they'll ever find that dang seal skull from the seal incident um, in the Eobriga saga. Uh, you know what I'm you know remember what I'm referring to with that, Fjolner? No, no, what this is the this is from a bit later on, so we're I don't think we'll get to it in this stream, but there's a there's that crazy incident with the seal. Actually, I think it's mentioned twice because you have the you have this like haunted seal. It's it's almost like comical. It's very weird. But we'll we'll have to get we'll have to get to that uh, later on, or save that. Maybe we'll save that one because that's it's too funny. Mm. But I'm always so, wondering. I'm like, when will the archaeologists find that dang seal? Mm. Yeah. So, so well, just to say here, I'll just summarize it a little bit. So basically, the seal the seal shows up, and um, it's described as like looking strange it like shows up in a in a house it's described as like looking slightly human or slightly like looking weird something about like its eyes or something are weird or kind of human or something so they just start like beating it and the seal like just looks at them like annoyed that they're like beating it and then they just like keep bludgeoning the seal because it's like freaking them out. They think it's haunted. There are stories in Iceland of of so-called like uh, shapeshifters who take the shape mm. of a seal, like like later legends. So they like 
Oh. Maybe this is the first of the shape shifting seals. <laughs> yeah, so there's that there's a whole Okay. Yeah. Keep keep going. I'll see if I can find the seal. Yeah, we, we might be get a deep dive on that later. This is like this is only the beginning of of eight picture saga. Yeah, and and and, uh, and we'll, how about saga. okay? We'll we'll save this for the end of today's stream, the seal incident, um, yeah, yeah. just so you, to keep you guys sticking around because it's so it's so crazy to me and so funny. Yeah. So evidence indicates that the people. Yes, who deliberately covered the temple at Ramham, took the stakes from the house with them, perhaps to a place where they settled in order to raise a new heathen temple. So this might have been uh, because of Olaf Trickwason was in Trondheim during that time, and he was. Uh, not having the paganism there and they were fleeing basically o Olaf's wrath that's one possibility <laughs> because it's the same it's the same area that Olaf was uh fighting Haraldur Hladjarl was it Hladjarl uh the he's a he's like a hero for neo pagans like yeah preserving traditions but then you know harald cut down his idol and he started reading so and you also do see a little bit with uh the incentive of avoiding tax that you know tax evasion is a, a time-honored tradition yeah. and has so, really led i mean how many settlements in the new world and in Iceland, how many people have traveled on great expeditions and adventurous voyages just out of tax evasion reasons? It's well, quite, I mean, not, quite a few, I think. You see, you see this though in the sagas. It is universally hinted across the sagas that this was mostly because these were jarls that were in in a feud or in dispossessed. By Harald, yeah. that that you know, I mean, they, he made quite a few enemies. He was he was like centralizing power, yeah. And it might have been like you see, for example, with Thorold and Thorold Mostraskek, you had these different jarls and Gode. Either you know they, they were losing influence, or maybe it could have been like there was this honor culture that Harald was kind of disassembling, you know, with with a more of a law based culture. And they were like not having it. So so the and the Gwadi was like an intellectual class that wanted to keep the old form of government here. That's that's very very possible. Yeah, you but see also, it remaining yeah. more decentralized. Yeah, yeah. In Iceland, impressively. Yeah. They wanted to, you know, they didn't want these. But Harald, he was like, he was just a pure Machiavellian, basically. He he wanted to rule Norway and unify Norway. And we, we are going to do a deep dive on him, him sometime. But, but if you go to the next slide. So... In Thorstness, there was a mountain in Thorstness that was sacred to Thorulur. And he declared that no unclean man may gaze at it. And no living creature could be harmed unless the circumstances were natural. Like if some sheep there died you know, a trip or diet or something, stuff like that. Or this mountain should be called Helgafell, which literally means holy mountain. And Thorle wanted himself and his kin to be laid to rest there. Thorle found it a thing on the tip of the 
Nes, the, the peninsula, where the totems had landed. And it was referred to as Thorsnes Thing. That site was so holy that no one could desecrate the field either with heftarblóð, which means just bloodshed. Heftarblóð is a word when you shed blood on a sacred site and desecrate it thus. Or Alfrek. Uh, heftarblóð, yes, and Alfrek means to take a shit, basically. <laughs> so to take a shit, you had to go all the way to a rock called Dritsker, which was so <laughs> basically you, you couldn't spill blood or shit on the island. It was so sacred. So <laughs> others soon moved to the area and thoroughly lived there as I was it called Rusnar Madur Mikil, which means great man or a chief of great stature and nobility. And we should go get into a later, you know. There was a apparently Thorolus descendants. He is like a, his own clan. Uh, they are called Thors Nesingar. And Björch descendants. He is he, he spawned like another clan called Kjall. Kjallikingar, Kjall Eklingar, and Kjallikingar, they were kind of, you know, there was, it, this is later in the, in the, in the Eyjabika saga, and this is like much later, they were, apparently the Kjallikingar grew really arrogant, and they said, okay, look at these, you know, these Thorsnesingar, they think they're so high and mighty and holy. We're going to desecrate their site and we're going to just trample it and shit on it. And then Thorsnesingar apparently, you know, said no. You, they fought them and they fought them at, at the site and the site was desecrated by Hiftablod. It was like a small skirmish between the two clans. And so the whole, you know, thing had to be moved because the whole area had been desecrated. It was no longer sacred. Hmm. So, so, and the rock, a rock is described at the center of the thing. Uh, and it is described thus, there is yet to be seen a doom ring, where a man, like an oath ring, where, where, where the, a doom ring, where the doomed, where doomed men, where men were doomed to be sacrificed. In that ring stands the stone of Thor, which those men were broken, who were sacrificed, and the color of the blood on that stone is yet to be seen. So the doom ring, maybe something different than an oath ring. So we get like a interesting glimpse into this material cluster culture and some evidence of like men being sacrificed on the on the rock. There was a rock at the center of a thing, which was not, I think, in the temple. It was out, it was on the nes. The temple was in a different place, but the thing itself was outside and men encircled that rock. It was like a meeting place. So that is also really interesting, like human sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty interesting. So if you go to the next slide. You're hearing me, right? Uh, my mic and camera kind of shorted out for a second. Yeah, so this is Helgafell. Uh, next slide. This is Dritsker. This is where they took used to take a shit. So careful where you step over there. Yeah, yeah. 
So next slide. So, this is the rock that supposedly. Oh, there it is. They, Thor's they stone. All right. Yes. Sacrificial rock. It's still okay. there. And so I this mean, so this rock would have involved human sacrifice then? It were placed on the rock and the blood of the sacrificed man was spilled was spilled on the rock, apparently. Hmm. Interesting. I'm curious what the choosing process was for who was sacrificed and who was not. Yeah, yes. That's... Um, you you do have the account from even all Fadim of the of the slave girl who was sacrificed with the Jarl or the the yeah, yeah the high status man, but that's pretty much all we have as far as I know. Maybe as as it written, was written accounts. May, I, I I suspect like human sacrifice like a really special occasion like if if well if the crops were really really crappy and. <laughs> you were really desperate. I had to sacrifice a slave or something to yeah. really get Odin's attention or Thor's attention. Like ASAP. Like a last resort, maybe something like that. But I Yeah, I mean it's not it's not a you know, it's not a cheap thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> so or, or maybe it was like a part of a funeral. Like uh, yeah. who knows? So we go to the next slide. So again, we get contradictions in to Björn's journey in in Saga and and Laxadala Saga. Both of his, you know, his journey to Iceland. So in Saga, you know. He sailed west, Björn sailed west over the sea, you know, he and Thorvaldur, Mostoskeg, sundered as, you know, Afrostad, and he made for the south of the Isles, you know, but came west over sea, then, you know, was Ketit Flatnir, he was dead when he arrived, but he found there Helgi Bjóla, his brother and his sisters. And they offered him good entertainment with him, with them. Good sanctuary, you know. But Björn saw that they had another troth, and no wise manly it seemed to him that they had cast off the faith that their kin had held. So apparently they had converted to Christianity, and he had no heart to dwell therein. And would not take up his abode there. Yet there he, yet was he. The winter through with Eyður his sister and Thorstein her son, so he stayed the winter begrudgingly. But when they found that he would not be at one with his kindred, they called him Björn in Östri or Björn the Easterner and deemed it ill that he would not abide there. So Björn in Östri, Norwegians were often called Öst, Östmen. Really? Would that mean East, Eastmen? Yeah, and, and people who lived in the Isles would be often always be called Westmen. Okay, yeah. So this is a nickname like, ah, oh, you, you're you're so pagan, like you come, you're you're an Eastman, such an Eastman, you know. So, <clears throat> because obviously Christianity was more widespread in the Isles, I, I would suspect. Yeah. But this is according to Air Picasso. You know, this is totally different in in. Laxadala saga. So in Laxadala saga, uh, uh, 
Okay, this is gonna, this is gonna continue with Epic as well. So this is also from Epic as well. Björn was, you know, he was two winters in the South Isles before he sailed to Iceland. And with him in that, you know, fairing was Hallstedt Thorlsson, the son of Thorlu Mostraskeg. They made haven at Breiðafjörður and took land out from Sta Stavará. Uh, that and Hraunfjörður, you know, between Stavará and Hraunfjörður. You know, by Thorolfur's permission also. Thorl was there already. Apparently, he, he arrived before them to Iceland. So, Björn, you know, uh, Björn dwelt at, you know, Borgholt in Bjarnahöp. And he was, you know, the most noble hearted of men is described. And Hattstedt, the son, you know, deemed it less than manly to take land at the hands of his father. So he fared west of Breiðafjörður and took himself land there and dwelt at a place called Hallsteinsnes. Uh, certain winters thereafter came out Auður, you know, Djúp Auða. And the first winter she was with Björn, her brother. But afterwards she made, you know, her own, you know, all, all of Breiðafjörður. I think a huge tract of land and dwelt in a place called Kvammur. So, like in those days, all of Breiðafjörður was settled, but, you know, little need there is to speak of land taking of those men who come not into the story. So, however, in Laksdæla saga, this is, if we go to the next slide, Oh, yeah, let me get this here. Oh, wait. Yeah, there you go. Wait, hold on. Sorry, one second. Stream being slow there. All right, Bjorn's landing. So, in Laksa de la Saga, I'm going to describe something a bit different. So, this is what it says in, you know, Ilaxtala Sala, you know, after a Ketil made a great feast, he, he sailed straight to Iceland in Ilaxtala Sala. And after a Ketil made a great feast, and at it, you know, he married his daughter, Thorun Hirna, and Helgi Magri. This means Helgi the Thin. And that summer, Ketil's sons went to Iceland with Helgi, their brother-in-law. Uh, Björn, the son of Ketil, brought his ship to the west coast of Iceland to Breiðafjörður. So it's basically, they settled in the same place. And it is so so the so the place names match between all of the sagas. Bjarnarhöp, the the land between Stavo and Hrinsfjörður, and also the genealogical record. They married the same women, uh, the children are named the same. So it's the events that are mostly different. But the 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 genealogical, you know, information and the places are all like like they, they match there's no contradiction there and apparently you know brought he brought his ship you know to the west of coast of iceland sailed up the fjord in the southern shore uh, cuts into the land where the high mountain stood to the Nes in the side of the bay. And apparently there, I think, in he used Antvesulur, the, the totems again, in I think in Lakstalasara. Pillars. He he used uh, 
he, he used pillars, but not in Elbigisor, I think. So all of them apparently did this. They all of them tossed up pillars from the ocean. So, and, and he gets the name Björn Östmaður, you know, Björn Östri, you know, afterwards, because Björn, you know, took, the reason why he gets his nickname in Blackstallasvaga is because, you know, Björn took for himself all the land between Stavar Hrensur and abode, you know, the place that ever after was called Björnhöfn. He was called Björn the Eastman. So this is like east of Iceland. So the reason why he was called Östmaður in Östri in Laxdalasaga was because he lived in east. He took land of the eastern of Iceland, east part of Iceland, northeast. But in Eirbyggjasaga, it's because he, he was like a, he was a pagan and, you know, his family was Christian. And it was a nickname for, from his family. It was like such a Norwegian or something. So it really contradictory there. Mm. So if you go to the, yes, and Hel, so yes, and Hallstedt, uh, Settled in Hallsteinsnes, or yeah, settled in Kamur, Helgi Bjóla, settled in Kjalanes, which is a, which is a, the, the, the lower nest, the, the, you know, the corn, corn's realm, basically. Uh, but it's a beautiful area, though. It's like Esjuberg, you know. Helgi in Magri settled in Eyjafjörður, and in a nest called Kristnes. So... We'll pull up, we'll pull up Kjalanes again for... So it's this lower sort of yeah. boot looking part. Yeah. Oh wait, so, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. So Kjalnes, that's um uh, Kjalnes is where No, Kjalnes is part of Reykjanes, sorry. Oh, oh, okay, there we go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Re Reykjanes is the, the boot looking. Yeah, yeah. Thing. Reykjanes Kjalnes is, is... Kjalnes is like a like a part of of the, I think. Which Yes, okay, yes, it's part of, gotcha. Now pull out again for reference for the uh, whole island here so everyone can see. So yeah, like Kjal, Nena Reykjanes, Faxaflói, Snæfilsnes, up and then Breiðafjörður, and then the Westfjords on top. There we go. And Helgi the Thin settles in so A of Yodur, which is Christmas. Yeah, and Nes where he settled was called Christmas. Gotcha. So, so, so if we go to the next slide. This is Christmas where Helgi Helgi the Thin settled. Let's go to the next. So Helgi Magri is an interesting character. Uh, so he is what described of mixed faith. He worshiped Thor at sea and Christ on land. Again, we have a which wasn't whole, wasn't unheard of by any means. Yeah, so the sort of mixed faith at that time. Yeah, but we, we see this again, the association of Thor with the sea. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting to me in that in Christ with land. Because you do yeah. and they probably wouldn't have had a thorough understanding of all the stories of scripture where Christ calms the sea and so forth. But it, it is said that he wanted to settle a new land where he could live out Christian virtues. So, hmm. I, I mean, who knows? But but obviously, you're not supposed to worship pagan deities. In, but maybe, I, I don't know. So, so, but his father was Aventus, and his mother was called 
Rafar, Rafarta, and she was an Irish princess. So you see, so again with the Icelandic, which which he did not, which uh, wasn't revealed right away. We'll yeah. So, so so again, I the Celt the Celt Iceland dilemma. The, the Celtic theory of Icelanders is like more than half of the women were Celtic slaves, which I think was, I know, was complete bullshit. Uh, it was not on, it was like, it was not frequent, but it happened that Vikings, you know, obviously Hersir or 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 Jarls or stuff like that, like these well-off guys who could afford ships, they married sometimes into Irish nobility. That's not unheard of. And there are like records of that. And but and they also moved not only to Iceland but to Norway and probably Sweden. You know, this was just a just a means to gain more wealth but we see all these dudes they brought their wives and if their wife is celtic it is described and they are not slaves they're always like and it is very in very few cases but yeah but the yeah, bulk no of ice but the bulk of like the peasantry from iceland like after these guys had colonized like the like the surf class came definitely from norway you know, and we're just Norwegians. So, like I said, there's no evidence of that. Like half of the women, like no fucking way, you know. <laughs> oh my, no, my bad. I was confusing. I was confusing him with uh, Hoskold, who buys the slave woman, who then it turns out is a is an Irish princess. Yeah, 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 but but no, no. Helgi is like he married an Irish nobility, you know, just before he left Iceland. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. So even yeah, no, Helgi's father, Helgi's father. Yeah. Sorry. And most of these guys, they stayed in Ireland. They became like Anglo Norse Anglo. There was like a specific ethnos that was. Like in Norse Ireland, scales. the Norse scales, they wasn't they, they they didn't migrate that much to Scandinavia. And then they like just assimilated into the into the Irish, you know, gene pool, which explains the tremendous amount of you know the the the, the results on the DNA tests, which can be like misinterpreted as twenty percent of. Gaelic blood in Iceland as well. It's actually the other way around, you know. <laughs> so, mm. so if you like, if you go to the um, next slide. So, so, Björnarhöfn. This is a really, really cool. This is where Björn on Björn lived. And in Laxdala saga, uh, you know, it is said that, you know, Björn's landing after he had made a great feast at them, you know, and he married Þurun Hirna Helgi Magri. He was Helgi's in-law at uh, in Laxdala saga. And that summer, Ketit sons went to Iceland with Helgi. And you know, they brought the ship to Iceland to bear through, sailed up the fjord. So, and, the, and this is, uh, this is today, this is Bjarnahub. This is a really beautiful place. I've been there. Um, this is, this is on a, now a museum. Well, I think this is one of the only places in Iceland where they manufacture like authentic fermented shark. So if we go to the mm. next slide. I didn't even know that was something you could eat. Yes. I'm, I'm so, just going to switch headphones here. My Bluetooth earbuds are falling asleep on me. Yeah.
So this is a there we go. Yeah, so so this is a all right. So is this the fermented sharp? What, what am I looking at here? Yes. This is where they dry. Uh, did I mess this, up all my audio settings? Hold on. Hold on. All right, let's see here. Headphones. There we go. Can you can you hear me? All right. Check check. Can you hear me? Can you hear me if you're on there? Chat, yes, yes. can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Test, test. Oh no, have I have I have I messed everything up? Um, do I need to jerry rig some situation? What's going on? Hello. Type type one in the chat if you can hear me. Hold on. No, if you're on there, can't hear you if you're on there. <laughs> oh, no. I, I hold think, on, I think hold that, on. I think all right, all right, everyone, bear together. You know, it's these struggles, really. It's these uh, challenges that pull us together, that really, really bond us as a, as a live stream group. You. Oh, my goodness. Can the chat hear me? Type two. If it says you my hear mic me. is working. Okay. No. Let me, uh, let me, all right, if you only say something, I think I can hear you. Hello, hello. All right, all right, I fixed it. Uh, all right, all right, no need to uh, need to praise uh, for all the praise in the chat. You know, I know you're saying, wow, Matt, you're such a hero. You're saving the stream like normal. Hey, all right, all right, enough enough flattery. Uh, <laughs> let's, get, let's get back to it. So we left off uh, with the shark, I believe. Okay, so so this is uh, fermented shark. This was actually a method not in the Viking Age. This is not much later. So uh, I think I think this was like in the thirteen hundreds. This method was developed. So because shark is so full of ammonia. You will die if you eat it, so you have to process it in a special way before it becomes edible. And it tastes really unique and, you know, you should try it. It's really good, though. Uh, mm, I've never tried shark. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's a shark it's, next time I'm hanging out, in the, hanging out in the ice, as they say. We are, we are the only ones that... that do this ferment shark and eat it. I, I'm not sure. I don't think we mm. can do it. What does it taste like? It's kind of like cheese, but like with like a bit of a more bitter sour, you know. You should... Wow, that's crazy. So it's like a real thing. So yeah, if you go to the next. Alrighty. So this is Kwammur. This is where either Dupu are settled. Mm. Oh, next right. slide. This is also Kwammur. I think this is a photo from the 50s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah so this is like a... Lovely. Okay, next. Is there, are there a lot of sheep in the area? Get the sheep in the picture? Uh, no, I don't know. I, I, Kwammur is like... I, I've never been there. This is Eshuberg. Uh... This is the this is the place where where he lived. Mm. It really the the houses down below really give you a sense of the scale, the mountains behind him. That's crazy because you don't have trees, you don't have all these trees to really reference for size. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Nord Nordenon wants to live there. Yeah, no, I understand that. Yeah, live out in the middle of a beautiful 
This is where Helgi Helgi Bjóla lived apparently in Esuberg and there's a farm there today and this is a possible site of Kjalanes thing which is a mm. you know another thing it it was a thing that I described that was founded by the I think the great grandson of of Ingul Ardason remember that in the, in the last stream He owns a legacy. So, in Laxdala saga, so yeah, his, you know, son for Kjallakur and Ottar. Uh, Björn's legacy is actually does not contradict in in no other sagas. It is the same, basically. So, uh, Kjallakur and Ottar uh, so and Kjallakur's children were Þorgrímur Góði gerður um Helga and Þorgrímur was the father of Vígastir. That is another special character, the guy who killed the two berserkers. And Vermundur. Uh, I think Vígastir also, have you read the, the part about Vígastir in Eirbyggja Svara? Yes. Yes, okay, okay, okay. So, so he Helga married so, Ausgeir is called Vestar in Laxdala saga. So, this is the only contradiction I could find. Mm. And Kjallakur's descendants are called Kjallekingar. Kjalleklingar. And, and in uh, Eirbyggja saga, you know, Björn in Östri, it is that he died first of these land settlers and was buried at Borgalækur. And that is how he died apparently of old age. So if we go to the next slide. At Þórólfur. So, you know, Þórólfur apparently, he, he married in his old age. And you know, he had to wife, his wife was called Unnur. And Thorolur and Unnur had a son who was called Steyn. And that, you know, lad, Thorolf, you know, Thorolur named, gave him the nickname Thor Steyn. You know, because obviously. Yeah, there's um, kind of a Thor <laughs> yeah. theme going on there in that yeah, family. Yeah. And, Thor Olver, he was originally called Trollver. Thor, Thor is also a name in Iceland. And Thorsted is also a name. So we have, again, cases of names becoming, like nicknames becoming actual names. But remember that in, wasn't, wasn't it, uh, wasn't it uh, the guy who sailed to Thrapnafloki? He was also mm -hmm. called Thorolus. Yeah, yeah. Thorolus Smear. So, and that was which, before. Which can make it a little confusing when, when referencing things yeah, yeah. at this time. So maybe, you know, like, it was a common nickname. Everybody who worshipped Thor was called Thorolus. I mean, who knows? Could be. So... You know, and uh, so Thorstein, you know, he was a boy of, you know, high intelligent intelligence, apparently. Brauger, it was like he was very smart, apparently. And he became like a, like a, some sort of wise man later in, in Eirbyggja saga. And Hallstein uh, had... Thorosson, he was married to a woman called Osk, and his son was also named Thorsted, because why not, and he was fostered by Thorolur for some reason, they didn't raise him themselves, because this Thorol was such a chat, you know, and Thorst, he, he called him 
Þorsteinn surtur, which means Thorsted the black. But his own son he called Thorsted Thorskbitur, which means Thorsted Kotbite. Kotbiter. It was a really weird name. <laughs> yeah, I was confused about that when I was reading through. I'm like, why would yeah. you what? So surf, kid. surtur is also, you know, the N-word in Iceland. Just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will uh, refrain from saying that. Yeah, yeah, so, so, and Thorler, he died at Hofstadir of old age. And then Thorstein Thorspeter, his son, took his inheritance after him. He was buried at Haugsnes, west of Hofstadum. And at that time, you know, so great was the pride of the kin of Kjallakur, you know, Björn's descendant, that they fought, thought themselves before other men in the countryside. And so many were the kinsmen of Björn, that there was no kindred so mighty in all Breiðafjörður. So, if we go to the ne next slide. This is where he was apparently buried. Mm. This Ness right there. And if you go to the next, this, yeah. Let's see. Oh, wait, that's, that's it for the slides. Yeah, okay. So, so yeah, the, the end. The end, yeah. All right. Well, chat, um, I'm going to tell the little, I, I found the, yeah, I found the location of the story in Ebrega Saga of the seal. So we do have the seal story to get to. And while I'm doing the seal thing, uh, if you guys have questions, drop them in chat. We'll get to those as well. So, okay. So I'll pull this up on screen because how could you, this, this to me, you know, there's so many important events that happen in the saga. But this bizarre thing just stuck out to me so much. That's the crazy thing about like old literature is you get these like, you just get these sort of random stories that are crazy. And again, this is in the ye old English. So pardon me as I uh, sort of blindly go through it. But we'll just start here at the top paragraph. So this is about this is just at the start of the last third of the saga you get all these weird tangents in it and this is one of them so one evening and now i'm quoting from the saga so one evening when met sat by the men sat by the meal fires they heard how quick the stockfish was being riven out of its skin but when men looked thereto they found they're not quick but in the winter a little before yule goodman thorod went out to Ness after his stockfish. They were six together in a ten oar and were out there night long. Man. And remember, I had to read, I read all of this in the Old English, so I'll see if I can find a better, more modern version. Anyway, the same evening that Thorod went from his home, it fell out at Frodus water when the mule fires were lighted and men came gathering into the hall that they saw how a seal's head came up through the floor of the fire hall, a certain home woman came forth first and saw that hap and caught up a club that lay in the doorway and drave it at the seal's head. But it rose up under the blow and glared up at Thorguna's bedgear. Then went a house carl thereto and beat on the seal, but at every blow it kept rising till it was up as far as below the flappers. Then fell the house carl swooning, and all that were thereby were fulfilled with fulfilled of mighty dread. Then swaying Kiartan thereto, and took up a great sledgehammer, and smote on the seal's head. And great was that blow, but the seal only shook its head and looked about. But Kiartan smote one blow on another till the seal sank down therewith, as if he were at the knocking down of a peg. But he smote on till the seal went down so far that he might beat down the floor over the head of him. And so indeed it fell out the winter through that all the portents dreaded Kjartan the most of all. <laughs> so there it is. There's the seal story. 
I I just love the sentence when it says, um, how does it go? When it says, uh, but it rose up under the blow and glared up at Thorguna. <laughs> so it's like it's clubbing the seal and then it just gets like glares at them. So they've smashed it in the head. Yes, thank you, Nordenon. Yes, we'll we'll have to have our we'll have to just do some readings more often. Uh, what do you make of that story, Fjolnir? I mean, does that does that kind of ring a bell? I think this is mentioned elsewhere too. I I thought I was I thought this is mentioned in I don't know some some other place. Yeah, there's also uh, a story like you have this weird. There's this folk tale about a priest in Iceland, but this is from a medieval, I think, I'm not sure when, uh, much, much later. Like maybe from the Reformation era, called Simon the Frothy. Simon, the, you know, the, he, I think he was actually a historical figure. He was a real, he was born in 1056 and died in 1133. And there was this like, a weird lore has it and uh folk tales evolved around him that he was always out witting the devil and uh, one time the devil and uh, he was trying to get into an island you know crossing a, 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 a like a body of ocean and the devil offered him to you know offered him a right in exchange for his soul and he said you know fine and he, that will turn himself <laughs> into a seal oh, and, man. and during the journey he smacked the devil in the head with a bible <laughs> and and he was you know forced back to hell something like that so <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> this is a lot and it's like all these stories like we outwit the devil all the time so <laughs> <laughs> that's like the stories that's like the the american what's that american story about the the devil just getting uh outwitted by like a fiddle player like some hillbilly yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, this is uh this is uh like our seals i mean they have been associated with super the supernatural that's funny. Like, yeah, I don't think of seals as being associated with the supernatural at all. You have you have the shapeshifters. You have the stories of like hamskifting us that who take who can take the shapes of seals among other animals. Like like when you know they they just literally dress up as she seals and live like seals and then become human at a certain time. But then you have like the literal devil is, is a seal and it's like really devil went down to georgia yep that's it, that's it yeah. so and also interesting like this holy mountain with thorus this is like the, the whole area is sacred no blood can be spilled uh everything you know you cannot gaze upon this area this kind of reminds me of you know the old testament actually mm. so if you think about mm. it like like sacred yeah. mountains were sacred and you had these sacred areas like in the temple also no blood could be spilled no unclean could enter after you touch a corpse, you were unclean. After you like had sex, you were unclean. After you had drink, drank the blood of a animal, you were unclean. Like shit, like that, you know. Yeah. Only. No, it is very similar. Yeah. Yeah, with, like obsession with like cleanliness and sacred and marking of an area. This is like I'm wondering if the, if this is the actual paganism or is this like again. Christian doctrine trickling into the verbal storytelling. Yeah. So from the like the Bible, you know, so they, it changes over time with a with a zeitgeist. It's like you have to ask yourself that, you know, like is Thorolud also like an added character because he is he just appears in 
Eirbyggjasaga? That's a good question. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, I'm one has to want to, but I, th I think, I think you know, you have, you have the descendant. You have his, he, he founded a thing, and he lives like a clan. So he probably was a real, real dude, you know. So. But yeah, this is think that. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, with with that, I think we'll wrap it up for this stream. Uh, we'll be doing another deep dive. I'm not sure if we'll be – the next one will be part of this Origins of Iceland or if it'll be something maybe more related to myths and legends. But we'll, we'll let you guys know as soon as the next stream is planned out. Uh, we're always looking for more guests. So if you guys have recommendations for guests – to have us invite onto the stream let us know uh give us a comment about that yeah be sure to hit like uh also this week or last almost two no last week put out the video on the berserker documentary so that's been doing really well if you haven't seen that go check it out uh fuel near uh helped out with that and yeah we worked really hard on that got a great result also put out another video on uh just covering a little bit about just some thoughts on hogwarts legacy so go check that one out as well uh and then yeah do you have any closing thoughts fielder uh yes just i mean i don't know um, next live stream i don't know the chat maybe if you have any ideas yeah feel free to throw some ideas our way but I think with that, we will close it down. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to put all these videos together in a playlist. So it'll be easy to just kind of go through them all. But with that, hey, thank you all for joining us so much. We'll catch you guys on the next Deep Dive.